Hi there. Uh, my name is Eric Jennings. Um, I'm speaking today on Telhash, and uh, it's a protocol that specifically helps applications on your computer speak to each other without any centralization whatsoever. So um, it's fairly new. Uh, it also has uh, uh, some neat um, aspects to it that I'll get into uh, during this talk. Um, first, about a little bit myself. Um, I, like most people, have come around to uh, the agorism concept kind of a roundabout way through libertarianism and whatnot. And so uh, being a software engineer by trade, I am um, constantly looking for tools and techniques to use um, to help uh, in kind of like the cause of, of getting um, decentralization to work well and for people to connect directly with each other. And uh, Telhash is a pretty cool concept for that. So um, I thought it would be something good to talk about for this, uh, for this unconference. Uh, let's see. So Telhash. Um, the first thing about it is that it's it's distributed peer-to-peer uh, -peer DHT, what they call a distributed hash table. And uh, actually, to preface before I start, um, this talk's a little bit technical. Um, we'll get into <coughs> excuse me some of the actual aspects of how it connects and what it does. But I'll try to always continue to bring it back onto the uh, the aspect of of what it is and why we have it. And so, if it gets a little technical, bear with me. Uh, we'll get back up to the why um, as soon as I can. Uh, so. Really, um, <clears throat> what it is, is uh, if you are familiar with your computer and how it looks up URLs and, uh, and domain names in your browser. So if you go to your browser and you, you type in um, you know, agora.io in your URL bar uh, in your browser, you click enter, and then uh, you get to the page. What happens during that step is that um, your browser goes and asks um, a DNS server, a domain name server, what IP address or what address, where can I find this server that is hosting Agora.io? Um, that is called the domain name system, DNS, and uh, it's very hierarchical. It's one of the few hierarchical aspects left over in the internet infrastructure. Uh, it asks your local ISP what, uh, you know, where this IP address lives, where it's at, or what the IP address is, rather. It then will, uh, if it knows, it will return to you the address. Um, if it does not, it will ask it's, uh, it's basically it, its provider for IP addresses, all the way up to a chain of command up until there's 10 or 11 or 12 root servers um, for all of the internet that are kind of the final deciders of what, where this address lives. And so uh, these, uh, if you think of DNS, if you think of IP addresses as street addresses to um, a house or to a location, and if you want to go visit a location, you need to find out where it's at. So you look in the yellow pages or you look on someone's website, you find the address. So you can actually get there. You know the name, you just don't know where it's at. So DNS works the same way. And uh, unfortunately, since there's only 10 or 11 or 12 root servers, um, and they're controlled by various corporations and government interests, uh, that is a uh, end-all, be-all concentration of power, which is kind of difficult to overcome using the internet. Uh, if somebody or some nefarious, for some nefarious purpose, wants to decide that you shouldn't be available on the internet, they can simply remove your name or your, or your domain name from DNS uh, through various means, both legal and, and illegal, um, or gray area legal, uh, to get you removed. And then at that point, anyone types your um, agora.io in URL bar, it comes back with not found, meaning no one can actually come to your website. So this is a really pro a big problem, obviously, for people who, uh, for uh, protesting, for, for people who are in, in places like the Middle East right now where there's lots of uprising, lots of um, community communication that is not uh, aligned with the government interests there at the time. Uh, that, that can be a huge concentration. You, you've probably seen several of the places where uh, they will literally shut down the Internet, so to say, and that essentially means they'll, they'll quit routing into and out of that country as well as probably messing around with the domain name system as well so that things that you typically visit within the site within the country no longer exist or no longer reply so back to telehash telehash is the best way to think about it is it is essentially a dns system that's completely distributed there's been lots of work in uh in dns uh in within the dns realm <clears throat> to try to get it decentralized and also to get it secure <coughs> excuse me and uh, the, this one is a little bit different because what happens is it actually saves the records of where things are within the network itself. There is no centralization in Telehash. It uses um, a, a technique called digital hash table. And what that is is really it stores 
various data points on the actual machines that are running themselves. So if you think, if you're familiar with BitTorrent or some of these other systems, they also use a distributed hash table. And what that does is it, it stores, uh, so if, uh, if, I'll give you an example. If I'm running a, a particular website or something on my own machine, I can join Telehash, I actually connect as one of the nodes to this entire network, and I start publishing out, hey, this is where this address lives. Um, you know, I, maybe I was hosting eric.agora.io, and I would put eric.agora.io lives at this IP address, and I would push out into the DHT, into Telehash, and it would go and kind of spread out throughout the network. And then as other people request that through Telehash, they would actually find, um, Telehash will route them back to me. Um, if, uh, if I decided that I wanted to um, find someone else on Telehash, I would, I would query Telehash rather than DNS, where is this at? And Telehash will route me to it. And um, something to keep in mind is that Telehash is, um, it's not uh, a complete anonymous system. It doesn't hide who you are. It doesn't um, encrypt what you're passing back and forth. That's at a different layer. Um, but what Telehash does do is allow uh, you to publish where you're at or looking for other places completely um, reliably and with no centralization. So uh, once Telehash tells you where this place is at, you want to visit it, it will actually tell you here's the IP address and here's the port number and now your, your browser, whatever you're running, can connect to that directly. Um, that's also another big plus that, uh, that is a little bit overlooked in the Telehash um, right now, I think, in, in the, one of the benefits of Telehash is that you can connect directly to your peer to do whatever transaction you want. And that's at, the, at that point is when you would do um, cryptography and, and key swapping and things like that to guarantee you're speaking with who you think you're speaking with, as well as encrypting that line back and forth. <clears throat> uh, it also makes it so that it's almost impossible to monitor because you happen to be connecting directly to some other server. You're not going through some central website to talk to someone else. Um, it's very much like Skype, if you're familiar with that, versus something like um, AIM or MSN, which goes through a central server. Skype connects directly to the other person. So that's a big, uh, technically <laughs> kind of heavy intro to what Telehash is. Excuse me. Um, a little bit to how it works. Uh, we're going to go a little bit deeper into the technology uh, just for a few minutes. Um, and uh, I think at that point, um, I'll touch a little bit on how developers use it as well, but then try to bring it back around to why this is important for, for decentralization and especially for a free society. Um, what it is, is uh, it actually, so how it works, rather, you've got uh, small snippets of, of information that pass back and forth. And, uh, and so if I was an application writer, say I was writing a new chat client for, uh, for the algorithm movement or for people in general to chat with each other directly, maybe I've decided I don't trust Skype now that they've been purchased by Microsoft or whatever. Or maybe I live in, in Libya or Egypt and decide that I don't trust any software other than the one that I can write myself and that I can use with my colleagues and friends and business partners. So I go about deciding to build a chat application on top of Telehash. The way it works is that <clears throat> I do everything the same. I use the same network uh, libraries that a typical software developer would use, except that instead of dealing with DNS to actually look up where this person's at, I would use Telehash. And so um, a little bit, kind of we talked about a little bit earlier, but Telehash will, um, will connect, will, will uh, provide the addressing for the application. So. Uh, a couple steps th that the actual um, that the actual app does is it just it, it connects to it. Uh, excuse me. It will actually uh, once it comes onto Telehash network, it will announce itself, push out a little piece saying, "Hey, here I am," and then that that little data bit will propagate out through Telehash, and then now it's part of the net mesh network, if you will. Um, what happens then at that point is uh, is it would continually go out and try to find more. Um, more neighbor nodes, more nodes that are around it, um, neighbor being uh, close to it from a network standpoint, not necessarily a physical standpoint. So that what happens is that if those uh, once, if any sort of the, any part of the network starts to be um, starts to go down or is, or is unreliable for whatever reason, each uh, segment of the Telehash network will actually uh, know where to find other uh, peers to request data from, and so it's fairly self-healing in that sense. You could take out a large swath of, of a Telehash network after it's up and running, and uh, it's still going to be able to find most of what it needs to do. Each, each node would hold, um, I believe, between 
10 and 20 other peers or other neighbors, meaning that if, you know, five or 10 other neighbors even go down, then you can still get to many different places. You can get everywhere, you just route around it. If every node does that, it would take a large, large number uh, to actually knock out the Telehash network. Um, so it's, it, from, a, from a developer standpoint, it's fairly innocuous. There's not much different you do. So that's exciting to me because that means the adoption for using Telehash uh, is, very, uh, is very low. It's very high, rather, because it's a low barrier to entry. Um, that that is a that's an important aspect I think that some people overlook. Um, to take a quick aside, there are some other um, network topologies and some other technologies out there that are really exciting in this space as well. There's uh, there's obviously the Tor network if you're familiar with that. Um, I2P is another one. Uh, these are networks that that do something similar to Telehash, although they are more comprehensive in the sense that they are trying to provide a certain level of anonymity as well as um, guaranteed delivery and encrypted uh, through certain endpoints. They all have their weaknesses, though. Um, it's, it's prudent to expect that most of these networks will have certain weaknesses um, and strengths, and it's up to the user of those to determine what risk you know, um, profile they're comfortable with using, or maybe using a, a combination of these to, to um, get to the point where you, you, as a user, are comfortable with what's happening and are taking that appropriate level that you that you expect from the network you're using, um, almost, but almost anything better is better than what we're using now, uh, to be honest. So, I think that um, any of these is is beneficial uh, to use and to learn about. Telehash just happens to be another player, and it's one that I work fairly closely with. So uh, I have a uh, I have a dog in this fight, I guess. Um, let's see. So, a little bit about um, how what how it how it impacts day-to-day -day usage of the web. Um, I'll touch on that a little bit on that. I don't want to go any more technical. I feel like that's there's plenty of docs online. Telehash.org has all the information that you may want about how would you actually develop against this and what it does. And, and uh, I don't want to belabor that point. I'd rather keep it more focused on, um, on the whys. Uh, so the, it has some, Telehash has some unique techniques in the sense that it uh, it can bypass most firewalls and NATs, which, which are called, uh, NATs are like private networks that most people have at their homes or offices, where uh, essentially you, you'll have a, an IP address on your own machine, so the address on your own machine that is not publicly available. It just happens to be in this local network on a hidden IP address or a, a non-public one. And then as it visits the websites out in the internet or whatever you're doing, it, your router or your wireless you know, device will translate that into your own address. That tends to be a really big problem when you try to connect directly to others because you, those IP addresses are private. So if I was in Office A and I wanted to chat with a friend in Office B, there's no way for me to request to connect to, to private IP address in Office B if I'm in Office A. Uh, it's just one of the results of using um, what they call NAT addressing within most people's homes and offices. So Telehash actually helps remove that constraint by, um, by essentially punching a hole in that and, and making it so that you can connect publicly uh, to people behind NATs. And this, is, this sounds kind of nerdy and, and not important, but it is actually a major barrier to most peer-to-peer -peer networks uh, because most people almost always operate their computer and, and browse and do what they do. Um, on these sorts of networks. And so if, you, if they cannot participate in a peer-to-peer -peer network, uh, you know, as both a provider and a consumer, then, then they don't help bring health to the network. They don't help make it more resilient by adding another node to it. And they're also not reachable by other people. So, um, or if they are, then it has to go through a central server, which is exactly what we're trying to get away from. So it's, uh, it's it, Telehash allows this by, basically, uh, it uses some, somewhat similar to what Skype does in the sense that if I want to talk to a friend in uh, Office B and I'm in Office A, I connect to, to Telehash. Telehash now tells the world in Telehash where my public IP address is, the, the Office IP address. The um, person uh, in Office B wants to connect to me, ask Telehash. Telehash says, oh, I am at you know, someone's public IP address. And then what happens is, uh, is um, Telehash will actually open, um, since it's already got my connection open to it through Telehash, and it just got the connection request from the friend, it will actually glue those two together through some, some networking um, black magic sort of. It actually glues those two sockets together so that since we were both talking to Telehash, 
Telehash will say, hey, you two want to talk. Let me just connect your pipes together. And then you do, you do what you're going to do directly. And then Telehash steps out of it. So now, now we are both communicating directly from both behind our private NATs. Um, pretty cool and very important um, in terms of making, it in, um, making the, the network strong. If everyone is doing that, everyone's participating in it, then you have this thousands of nodes within Telehash that, um, you know, if an office network gets knocked out or, or, or the internet goes down at a particular office, those nodes go down, but everyone else is still on and connected to each other directly. And if that person comes back on at a coffee shop or something, they now join back up and the new public IP address uh, at the coffee shop is known to Telehash and now people can route to that. So it's, uh, it's, it's kind of a key component of Telehash and it's super important. And, uh, and that's, that surprisingly um, bypasses most firewall issues, um, most typical firewall issues you find in offices and, and homes, whether it's you know, home routers or um, libraries, things like that. Uh, they, most, most firewalls don't expect to have, uh, you know, um, they don't expect for this, this sort of functionality to happen, so they don't really block against it. If they did block against it, they would have to block outgoing, outgoing connections from the users inside of it, and that tends to cause a lot of problems because then people can't connect to websites and things like that, unless they get very detailed and filtered and, and use proxy servers and all these other things. You'll find in more sophisticated networks that they do have more difficult firewalls to bypass, and there are still ways around that. Um, although there, there's certainly a way if someone really wanted to be draconian, they could just lock off all outgoing firewall connections except through, say, port 80, which is your web browser port. Um, but then there's a little bit of work that can be done to try to uh, get around that too by using your own proxy servers. So it's kind of a cold war a little bit, just like any of these systems. But uh, just getting out of the NAT makes the barrier to entry for most typical users very, very low and uh, instantly lets you start talking to your friends uh, or colleagues um, early on, right? So it's an uh, it's, uh, it's important thing, I think. And I, um, I, I'm excited to see more people use the network uh, to see it grow. Right now, um, Telehash is, is, only, is a couple of years old. Uh, I'll give you a little history about it. I skipped that at the beginning. Telehash was, uh, was pretty much the brainchild of, of a guy named Jeremy Miller. And Jeremy Miller, if you're not familiar with him, is, uh, is very well known in the tech world. He, um, he first uh, invented, essentially, or came up or authored the, uh, the XMPP protocol. And XMPP is... Uh, is the chat protocol that I think over a billion people use now on various networks. So Facebook, chat, uh, AIM, uh, Jabber is, was his actual company that he came up with uh, to support XMPP. But uh, essentially, if you use IM pretty much anywhere, uh, you're probably using the XMPP protocol or the person you're speaking with is. And uh, so Jeremy was very, um, very instrumental in getting that going. He, um, he has... Uh, stated um, about why he did it was because back in the mid early 90s uh, chat was becoming very popular and, and it was amazing to see the communication between people happen so easily with, uh, with instant messaging however back then if you remember um, AOL pretty much owned the chat space with their instant messenger system it was about the only way you could chat there were a couple small versions um, other other products excuse me that um that could do that but pretty much AIM was the one and um, the problem that it caused, though, is that it was a central server, and uh, and so AIMs could start being draconian in its ways of what it allowed you to talk to or who you did. Uh, if you didn't pay your AOL bill, then you instantly got you lost access to all of that for whatever reason. Um, Jeremy saw that as a huge problem, rightly so, and so he set about <clears throat> trying to figure out a way to offer anyone to run their own chat server and then to let chat servers connect to each other. Um, it's it was, in some ways, it was almost a precursor to Telehash in the sense that it was trying to break the monopoly of this single, you know, server um, uh, um, topo topography into more distributed manner so that we can kind of move to that point. He states it didn't really quite go far enough in the sense that it still had central servers that you had to go through. You had to trust the person running the Jabber server um, to not kick you off or do whatever they're going to do, um, especially if they wouldn't tell you if they're going to start monitoring things or saving log files or something. So... He, uh, he started you know, having this brainchild of Telehash, which was kind of an extension of that. Um, XMPP was for chat what Telehash is for pretty much any network process, so, um, and it removes the centralization. So uh, Jeremy started working on this 
uh, I believe around two years ago, and uh, has started working more closely with actually getting up and running. And now there's actually uh, several Telehash nodes that run full time um, that are basically out there. So there's a Telehash network right now that's running. And uh, if you had the software that if you've written software to connect to it with your application, then you could start using it today. It is very new. Um, it doesn't have a lot of uh, functionality yet. That it's more more advanced functionality that's in the protocol specification, but it does do the basic. You know, join the network. Who's out there? Leave the network. Um, it's it's pretty pretty cool. So um, it's I think it's important to uh, to reflect on the fact that it's that that. Uh, kind of a, uh, an internet visionary saw a major problem with the way parts of the internet are structured and tr is trying to change it and uh, is is trying to move it into a better fashion. Telehash is a completely open source, by the way, so it's not owned by anybody. It's uh, it's You can actually download the source code um, off of GitHub or any other um, place it's hosted. Um, you know, modify it, change it, update it, and then kick it back. Uh, to um, another couple ways that it, it can handle firewalling um, and kind of network instability, I guess, especially within, the, you know, if there's some sort of revolution going on in a certain country, like, again, I'll use the Middle East or something as an example, uh, they, networks become very, very um, unreliable. And so what happens, uh, and I touched on this a little bit earlier, but just to recap, Telehash is very resilient to that. It can route around these sorts of things. Um, again, Telehash will tell you, will tell you as a user where someone else lives on the internet. It does not actually, you know, route through you or anything like that. So if you ask a Telehash node where your friend is at, your, and Telehash says, hey, it's at this IP address, one, two, three, you connect to that person. If that node that just told you that goes away and gets taken offline for whatever reason, it doesn't affect you at all. You're still connected to your friend. If your friend goes offline, once he or she gets back online, you know, you'll ask Telehash, the Telehash network again, where they're at. So it's very good. I mean, things can go up and down all the time, um, and it's it's resilient to that. And it was designed from the ground up for that. So uh, Telehash's strengths definitely um, riding around resiliency. Um, also, uh, completely distributed. There is no central server. If you try to take it down, you have to take down every person that's using it. Um, it does not handle anonymity, and it does not handle cryptography. So I'll touch on those in a bit about how to get around that aspect. Um, Let's see, so, uh, so yeah, so I think um, there's some work being done. So uh, let's talk a little bit about DHTs. Uh, Telehash speaks, um, th uses a, a digital hash table, it's called, um, sorry, distributed hash table. And what that is is that, um, that it, it spreads out information all over a network and tries to do so very, very um, standard-wise. So, so uh, there's, there's equal parts of data all over the network. And uh, some other technologies use this, like BitTorrent, if you're familiar with that. Um, BitTorrent will actually store um, where to find the files uh, that you're trying to download or upload. Uh, it'll, it'll store the file information within the DHT itself. Um, so in short, you can actually save data in this DHT. And you can think of a DHT as like a big cloud-based, almost, I, I dare say hard drive, but storage, I guess. You could save keys and values into it. So a key being, you know, uh, Eric's secret comment, and then the, the actual value being my secret comment. Whether it's encrypted or not, it doesn't matter. But I could take that pair, and I could put it into Telehash, and it could theoretically save it. Um, Telehash is not designed to save data by default because there are some cryptographic issues with that in terms of trusting who put what out there. However, um, if you start using some cryptography on top of it, you could actually sign and encrypt certain chunks of data, put it out there for Telehash, and then someone who has your, your, your cryptographic key can download that and then confirm that it is indeed from you and then also decrypt it. So while Telehash doesn't support um, anonymity or cryptography at its level, it's very friendly to put doing it on top of Telehash, which is kind of the idea. It's, it's difficult to get cryptography correct and it's almost, I would argue, and I think Jeremy would too, that it's difficult, it's probably the wrong spot to try to put it at the Telehash level at that protocol, that network level, because there's lots of different ways to do it and there's also different risk, um, risk profiles that need to be taken into account. And so based on what applications are using Telehash, they may want to use more or less of that. So it's, uh, it's, it's good to, I think it's good to leave that out of Telehash and to implement that on top based on what application you're building. Uh, so a couple of use cases I guess we can try going through. So we've talked about chat already. 
Um, chat is a great way to uh, quickly speak with somebody, obviously, and uh, if you can do that in a completely distributed and decentralized manner, um, it's a big win. Uh, um, file transfer works just fine over this. Um, you can share files with friends if you wanted to, uh, based on an application that would support that. Um, since you don't have the network, the, the NAT issues we were talking about, the private IP addresses, you, uh, you can connect to anyone who's on it, and then at that point, you can, yeah, you can pass files, you can chat, you can send email. Um, some people have been working on, on building kind of a distributed email system with IntelHash. It's pretty, pretty new right now, but uh, kind of cool in the sense that you could theoretically put a, uh, a, a message out to IntelHash, and, uh, and then anyone who is looking for it knows, your, knows what it's called, could say, hey, IntelHash, give me the message that's called this, and then receive it. Uh, pretty interesting. So it's... Uh, it's it's kind of a new way of looking at, at the internet in a way. You've got all these different services you use every day. If you use you know, web browsing, email, and messaging, and if you probably use online banking, or you do your banking uh, locally, or you, um, if you use something like Bitcoin, any of these things that you typically would use, if you use your telehash instead, take it out the middleman. And, uh, and that, that takes a little, at least for me, it took a moment to kind of really like, comprehend and let it sink in, because that that changes a lot of things. Um, it also gives developers a, a lot of new ways to communicate with each other through their applications that don't, uh, that don't handle uh, it very well through centralized servers. Um, uh, let's see, so one of the things that, uh, that is happening kind of in this space as well is that uh, there's the concept of um, personal data lockers, and it's something that I actually work on. Uh, mostly is is, uh, is this concept of of a, da of a data locker. That's um that's there's a project called Locker Project by also Jeremy Miller and uh, and a company called Singly. And uh, what they're trying to do with data lockers is literally um, allow you as a user to pull down your data that's out there so that you have it locally. And again, it's kind of in the same vein of you know these big central companies and corporations, governments even have your data. And that's your data, but it's they're holding it, and sometimes even using it as blackmail to give it to you only under some sort of you know either you pay for the export or they're going to sell your data without you wanting them to. That is really really uh, it's just nefarious. It's just there, there's something fundamentally wrong in my opinion about someone taking the data that I've generated and now not only not providing it to me but now leveraging it for their own gain. And uh, I know a lot of the other people feel that way. Some people don't mind as much, and uh, I understand that and respect that. But uh, for those of us who do, this concept of a data locker is, is really crucial. Um, if you have a data locker, like the Locker Project running, um, you set up uh, all of the systems that you connect to typically. So like you may have um, Flickr for your photos. You may have, you know, if you use Gmail or if you use a private IMAP, IMAP server for mail or whatever, you have it connect to all these different systems and then it will pull down all of that data for you and store it locally um, running on your machine if this locker is running on your machine as well. Uh, What's really cool about that is that now, excuse me, if any of these systems go offline, say Flickr decides to get bought or something, or Yahoo goes away, and then they're, they're gone and where are all your photos now? Well, if you've downloaded them into your own locker, you still have them all. Um, they're still on Flickr if Flickr is up, but if Flickr goes away, you have a copy locally. What's really cool about this, if you extend this now with Telehash, is that lockers are planning on using Telehash to speak with each other. So if you and all your friends have various lockers running on your own machines, and they're using Telehash, if I wanted to share a photo with a friend, then I can say share with you know, X, Y, Z, A, B, whoever the five people are, and Telehash will send them invites essentially through the application or, or let them know that they're available, and then they can connect to my locker using Telehash, remember, by looking up where I'm at and then connecting directly to me, and then viewing the photos that I've shared with them. So it's, if you've heard of, the, of this, the project called Diaspora or even Facebook, which is the, the, pub, the, the a commercial version of that, um, this whole social network concept can be turned on its head by using something like lockers with Telehash. You no longer need to actually, uh, you know, sign up with a server and, and uh, accept some huge, you know, uh, terms of service that's going to basically do whatever they're going to do with your, your data. You can just share privately with your friends. Um, you can even take it so far as having lockers that would then allow commenting on other people's photos. Um, Applications built on top of Telehash can do pretty much anything that applications do now, except that now you don't have to ask a server for permission to do it, um, or a company or a government. Uh, 
it makes a lot of sense for peer-to-peer -peer transactions in the whole Bitcoin world or if you know, do an open transaction type stuff or anything like that. Absolutely can use these Telehash uh, protocol to, to, um, to communicate directly. Uh, it's a good way to do so. And those applications are typically already good at handling um, the cryptographic aspects of this person is who they say they are and they know who they're talking to and, and whatnot. So that's at the higher level. But using Telehash to discover each other is brilliant and, uh, and is pretty hard to break. And so um, the Locker project uh, is also open source. And uh, for any developers watching this, I highly encourage you help to help. Um, it's really uh, it's starting to pick up steam now. And it's great to see people using it. People use it for all sorts of crazy things now. People are building data visualizations on top of their own data. So um, it's kind of compelling to think of your own data coming into um, to a central repository that you own that's on your own machine and then having having the correlation aspect to it so if i pull in all of say um if i have like a, a wake mate um system that, that monitors my sleep when i sleep and then i bring that data into it and if i also have say um all my what's a good example if i have like a, all my chat messages and it turns out that when i bring those in i find that there's a correlation between my sleep habits and how much i or how little i chat with somebody you can start to get a lot of really great information um, for yourself and for people that you trust um, very easily with something like the Locker Project. What is great about it is that all of these companies out there are trying to do that with your data already. So if you, um, if you now pull that, that power back to yourself and you start leveraging it, you now, uh, you now get all of that information that they would get for yourself and you can use it in whatever way you want and you can also keep it private if you'd like. Uh, people, like I mentioned, are building visualizations, so beautiful graphs and charts about, you know, your own data usage or whatever you are about. Some people are pulling in sensor data from their home networks or their home automation networks. So you have, uh, you know, a, a graph of your typical temperature or air cleanliness inside your house. Um, you can correlate that with, you know, how healthy your house is, or you can correlate, you can pull in public, um, government data to the degree that you trust it, you can pull that in and you can leverage that against, you know, your own data and seeing what the correlated. Um, completely open, you can pull in anything you want and then you can also push out whatever you want through Telehash. So this is one example of what, uh, you know, I envision Telehash being used as. Um, lots and lots and lots of other uses, but, uh, but the locker is one big one that I, and that I, I work on uh, daily to try to kind of bring around um, this concept of data ownership back to the user and Telehash is the way we do it. So. Uh, I don't have a bunch more. It's a little bit early. Um, I'm happy to take questions. I know that was pretty technical, and uh, I apologize for those of you who, who uh, if that went over your head a little bit or was kind of, um, you know, net talk sort of stuff. But uh, I'm happy to hear from people who have ideas about what they could use this for or what they envision this being used as, as well as answering general questions about how it works or, um, or you know, to what degree it can be leveraged and, and how safe it is. Uh, I'll watch chat here, see if anyone comes in. Um, while I'm waiting, I'll, uh, I'll, um, I'll touch a little bit too on, uh, on some other ideas. So there's a, there's a friend of mine who, uh, who, pulling up here, um, there's a friend of mine who, who is using Telehash to, uh, to basically encrypt like quickie messages for friends and almost like a Dropbox. So if you leave a, a drop message for, for a friend, um, I think that it, uh, the friend was um, was using basically like an encrypted version of of um, just typical text. So he would use he would encrypt it, put it out there. A friend would be able to grab it, pull it back, and decrypt it. Um, they had traded keys before, and uh, and so <clears throat> there's a there's a way to do um, encryption where you don't know. You guys, two people who want to share private data don't know of a key beforehand, a, a, a password to use for each, for, for encrypting, decrypting this data. They would, uh, they would end up um, using this one exchange to actually, uh, to determine a key on their own. It's called a Diffie-Hellman exchange. But um, long story short, it, it, what it allows them to do is that they can say, hey, I want to talk to you privately. And then the person says, sure. And then some cryptography magic happens and they're now speaking, um, privately um, with a shared private key uh, that they don't, that neither, that nobody else knows about and then they, and no one else can have. And then at that point, uh, if they talk later that day, they might have actually generated another key. There's lots of really um, 
easy ways now. People are starting to build stuff on top of this. And so I'm, I'm excited to see that. And um, admittedly, the reason, I, the reason I'm most excited about that is because that gives people, most people probably watching this, a good idea about what you can use this for without it being so technically advanced. Because I totally understand this is really heavy and, and just probably difficult to grasp. Um, I guess what I'm trying to drive home is that it it's, could be a sea change with how the internet works, um, along with Tor and I2P and some of these other ones, and even the typical GPG as well. Um, if people start thinking about it in this manner, rather than just, I've got to go to a Facebook.com or I've got to go to, you know, um, iChat or whatever they end up using, like if they start thinking of using these other systems and it starts becoming common vocabulary, then, uh, then that's, that's where it'll really take off and then people using this won't have, you know, it won't seem so foreign or complex to them. Nobody needs to know the details about it unless they're actually developing. And so, um, admittedly this talk went to developer mode and then trying to get back to user mode, but, um, but I guess what I'm trying to stress is that it would be fantastic to, um, to not be fearful of this, even though it seems complex. Like, considered as a completely decentralized way of communicating with each other, and then the ramifications of that. And then start finding things that you may want to use as an application that could benefit from being decentralized, if that makes sense. So, um, yeah, okay, some questions coming in. Um, super. So, yeah, so Joseph O'Donnell, um, this is a, how about this is a way to understand, uh, to get a URL name without paying $10 to a provider like Yahoo. Um, that is, that is true. Uh, it could act like that. There's not a, a registrar that you would sign up with. Um, the, 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 so you'd be able to say, I am so-and-so at so-and-so. You could just come up with a name and put it out there. And once it's in the, in the hash table, that is now connected to you. Now, how did you prevent people from actually squatting that and things like that? Well, there are some ways that you could uh, theoretically um, through uh, DHT, if you had enough nodes, you could override um, who a person is. And you also, and so uh, a network is only as healthy as its majority. We've seen that with Bitcoin and some of these other ones. If, if someone nefarious owns 51% of the nodes or controls 51% of the nodes on a network, it's no longer trustworthy for most part um, for most of these networks, including Telehash. Uh, so that's a caution to take. But yes, uh, if you wanted to be known as a certain name on Telehash, you could put it out there and then it's seeded into the other nodes. And now when people ask for that, it comes to you. Uh, that does also speak to something about people being able to spam um, the DHT with just gobbledygook or trying to grab a bunch of names and then own them because they were the first ones there. Um, theoretically could be done. Uh, the namespace is absolutely wide open though. So. Uh, it's, it would be hard to fill up the entire namespace, but you don't want everybody grabbing, you know, um, the best names and then just squatting on them. Uh, there are some, there's been some talk about how to get that fixed, perhaps using the, uh, a, a signed, uh, or a, a proof of work, a signed proof of work a lot like Bitcoin does, so that um, in order to take a name that's already there or to take a name at all, you have to do a certain amount of work. So there's some sort of um, level of difficulty to grabbing something new. And once you have it, no one else will be able to take it from you because they'd have to do more work than has already been done. And so that's a possibility. Again, this is a, a, a new part of Telhash that, or Telhash is new, so that this is a problem that, that uh, isn't solved yet, but uh, we can leverage kind of some of the other ideas that have happened in other networks that, uh, that solve this cleanly. So uh, another question. Um, right, yeah, liberty reason to use this, and that Joseph says again, is that the state can't as easily shut it down as the current DNS system. Yeah, scary. It's a scary thought. I mean, it's possible that if all hell breaks loose and U.S. government um, decides to shut down the internet with the internet kill switch or whatever, I would imagine one of their first things they would go after is DNS. Um, it's probably the lowest hanging fruit. There's only 11 root servers. They're not all located in the U.S., but most are controlled by U.S. corporations. And so I don't imagine it would take them very long to do what they need to do under some guise of national security or some other farce to say, pull it down, no way. Um, and then now everything you put into your browser or anything would just come back as not found. Uh, this is absolutely a liberty reason to use something like Telehash because there, there would be no kill switch at that point. You could always discover where everyone else is at as long as there's a certain level of number of people using Telehash. That's the, that's the flip side of this is people actually have to use it to make it resilient. If there's only two or three nodes, then you take out two or three nodes and there's no more Telehash. Uh, let's see. Um, Joseph asks, Eric, how important do you think ad hoc mesh networking is to stop Obama's internet off switch? That's, 
you read my mind. <laughs> I didn't even see that yet. Uh, ad hoc mesh networking is super important. Um, I believe, I personally believe it is the way, the best way at this point, um, from my knowledge of what's out there these days, to try to bypass that. Um, there is a little piece of hardware called, uh, a little computer called the Raspberry Pi, P-I. Uh, two words, Raspberry Space PI, and uh, they are based out of the UK, and it is, it's absolutely fundamental, I believe, to kind of bringing this about from a hardware standpoint. So we've been talking about software and networking today. Uh, the Raspberry Pi is a $25 device that's essentially a, com a full computer. It runs Linux stack. It, uh, you can put whatever you want in it. You can run Telehash on it. You can run your own locker on it. But $25, and you, I think the $30 version has an Ethernet port on it. But it, that's so inexpensive and so powerful of a computer now that you could theoretically have these um, ad hoc hardware mesh networks that Joseph was talking about where you could throw that in a waterproof box with, you know, a lithium uh, polymer battery on it to run it for, say, six months. Throw a rare earth magnet on the back and just throw it up behind like a stop sign or throw it underneath a, a counter somewhere. And if that acts as a telehash node, now you've just it strengthened the telehash network massively because now you've got... This, this little device that's just sitting there doing the routing and, and answering for people. And if everyone started doing these, like you can imagine, it would be near impossible to bring the Intellash network. You'd have to go and find every one of these little devices, turn them off um, and remove them or take them off the Intellash network. Um, lowering the friction to getting this to happen is key to getting it to happen. I mean, it seems obvious, but people are surprisingly res um, um, they're, they find friction very difficult. A very small amount of friction causes people to just not do things, especially when it comes to something like this. Because if there's an easier way, you can go back to Mises human action, it's like if it minimizes their discomfort less or, or more to just do it the easy way, they'll just do it that way. If you want them to make it so this is the easiest way to do it, just throw up telehash nodes, either on your own computer or these little devices, and, uh, and you totally just make this great network that is super resilient. Um, no one can control it. You want to make it stronger, you want to have an, a, your own presence on the web, have this little Raspberry Pi with your website on it. And so not only is it a Telehash node participating, but it could actually be your host. You don't have to pay for a hosting provider anymore. You could actually put it on there as well. Um, if it breaks or something, you're talking $25. That's like a month's worth of hosting account somewhere else. So it's ridiculous how, how low the barrier is becoming now. And uh, Telehash is trying to kind of be on that forefront along with this hardware development that's happening. Um, Let's see, more comments. Uh, yep, so uh, so Joseph uh, says, Eric, how important? Yeah, we talked about that. It seems impossible to get around the need for trust in network systems at some point. Yes, so if you don't trust your network itself, um, then you have a lot more work to do. So in other words, if you don't trust the actual bits going out after a certain point and coming in, um, your, your network provider, not even like DNS anymore, but say your, your ISP or the, the person paying for network um, where you're at. If you don't trust that, you've got more work to do. Um, it's still doable, but there's more gotchas. Uh, short of just blocking you off completely, um, there's this balance because a network provider blocking off all network support uh, essentially is not a company anymore. They're going to kill themselves because there's nothing left. And short of like national emergency and, and massive... Uh, you know, fascism in the sense where, like, it's, it's, you know, the government's actually running that corporation now or that network. Um, like, China is a great example. Like, that, that makes it very difficult. Um, however, China can only truly block it if they completely blocked off the Internet outside of their country. And if they do that, then we're stuck. Telehash won't work. Nothing will work. But if they do allow any sort of outbound connection, you can always route through other things and tunnel to get to where you want to go. And that's what most people in China do, to my understanding, is that they're using proxy servers or other ways to get out of China and then into other places um, through what looks like a, a, a very, uh, you know, docile site that they're visiting, a state-sanctioned site. But that site will actually redirect them to the, the site that is supposed to be blocked. So um, Telehash would help with that, too. Imagine having Telehash nodes that are act only as um, proxies or rerouters. They could they could answer as one IP address, but tunnel the real IP address inside the, the location, uh, whether it's encrypted or whatever, and then give that back to the original person. Uh, so China Firewall sees, oh, it's just trying to visit this benign site A, but the feedback that came back from Telehash would say, oh, yeah, you actually want to visit B. Here's the address, and then it could connect out through that. Um, like I said, it can't, it can't do 
advanced routing, but it can do it can do some good stuff like that and, and definitely help in that sense. Um, let's see. So uh, yeah, Joseph also mentioned a, uh, a in the chat. He mentioned a um, a link about the Libyan DNS being shut down. That's exactly what this is meant to to bypass. You don't want um, the less control that's out there in the hands of few, obviously, like the, the better everyone is, is um, in terms of, of their own well-being and, and operating in their own fashion. So um, the fact that there's actually examples of people doing this now and governments doing this uh, is all the more reason why I think this is a really ex exciting and uh, important project to work on. Um, it used to be in, in these circles that you would discuss uh, these things as hypotheticals, as and what if something crazy happened? What if 1984 happened? You know, it was very much in the cypherpunk uh, era of the early 90s um, about you know trying to get anonymization going and and secrecy going because it's it was foreseen as what if something like this happened someday, although it hadn't happened yet. Um, now we see just 20 years later that it has happened um, and it will probably happen again. So much more important to have experience and, and understanding about the vocabulary of these kind of advanced techno technologies like distribution and what's a DHT and what's peer-to-peer -peer and how does this work. It's better to talk about that in these sorts of formats now when we still have the ability to talk to each other and have video casts like this than to try to figure out from friends after there's some kill switch that's put in place and everything's down. So um, it's kind of good timing for all this, <clears throat> I think. And um, and I think it's, in a sad way, I'm glad that it's starting to happen a little bit because it's bringing the, the, the visibility of it up in more and more people. So, more questions? Uh, so, one more, one more touch on something, uh, and most of you may be experienced with this. This is more cryptographic than telehash, but um, there's concepts of, uh, there's different ways to, well, let me put it this way. One of the fundamental problems with telehash is that you don't um, you don't know who you're speaking to. You can't guarantee trust with them because anyone can spoof anyone else. So this lends perfectly to uh, what some people mentioned in the comments of, of GNU Privacy Guard or GPG or PGP. And what these technologies are is literally uh, uh, a set of a set of applications that allow you to guarantee who you are to somebody else. Excuse me, and it allows somebody else to guarantee who they are to you. And then also to say, I only want this one person to be able to view this data, and I only want them to be able to, I want to be the only one that can view it. So it guarantees somebody that you're talking to, and it also guarantees that the data that you send can only be viewed by them um, through cryptography, so encryption and things like that. This whole stack, this GPG stack, or this you know public key, um, asymmetric key kind of cryptography is incredibly important to something like Telehash or anything because it starts to, it, it sits on top and it guarantees the things that Telehash and these other networks don't. Um, I would love to see more activity, more talk about that, that stack of how end users, how people use that. Um, that's super crucial, I think, and I think it's understated or it seems too complex to a lot of people. Um, it would be fantastic to see that happen. In fact, I've even considered it, um, trying to maybe do a talk about that at a later one because I think that is, that is important. Um, even outside of networks, if you think about it, if you want to share data with a friend or a colleague, um, even over USB sticks, like not even on a network, or even on paper for that matter, if you really had to, like to understand those fundamental primitives is crucial. I, I would consider it as fundamental in our day and age as learning basic arithmetic um, or basic you know, grammar. It seems really hard when you first do it, but once you start using it and you see how the pieces go together, it's not that hard. It sounds hard and has a weird vocabulary, but so does trigonometry, you know. <laughs> Define a cosine before you actually took a trig class, and it's impossible. But, um, but once you start to learn about it and you start to figure it out, it doesn't become so, um, so opaque. And I think I would like to see that happen more. I plan on teaching my own children cryptography, basic cryptography. I think it's important. I think it's one of those things that uh, is a tool that science and mathematics has brought us that we are called upon to use, especially in this day and age, because it keeps... It keeps the power with, uh, with, the, with the fundamental locations it needs to be, which is the person providing the, the, uh, the data, the pers person wanting to do the interaction with the other without a central authority. So um, I think that's it. It's 7.49. If there's any other questions, I'm uh, happy to take them. Otherwise, um, we'll call it a talk. And again, I, uh, I do appreciate everyone watching. Uh, it's great. It looks like there's 28 people online. Um, very excited to be a part of uh, Agora.io and this 
Um, again, I apologize, I was a little bit technically heavy, um, kind of jumped right in with it. Uh, would love feedback on this talk as well. Um, I, I've uh, applied for this talk, uh, submitted to the South by Southwest Interactive um, Conference in 2012. I uh, don't know if it'll be accepted or not, but if you do want to vote for it, if you are interested in seeing this being spoken to to a bunch more people, uh, be happy to uh, to get your vote on that. That would be fantastic. It's at the, uh, the South by Southwest Panel Picker website. Uh, it's a little pitch. And then also feedback about the talk. Like if, if it was just plainly too technical, please let me know. If it was, uh, if you wanted me to go more technical in aspects, let me know. Um, I realized we had a, a varied audience, and so I was trying to touch a little bit on both. And so I realized that that sometimes means um, it's a little bit too much for everybody. So. Um, yeah, and uh, do ask any questions you may have. Um, you can you can contact me uh, through uh, the uh, the Telehash project on GitHub. Um, you can contact me through GitHub. My username is Eric T J uh, at GitHub.com or GitHub.org. Um, you also actually .com. You can also contact me through Twitter, Eric T J. Um, any of those ways, I'm happy to help people through things more. If you want to talk about it more, Telehash.org has all the nitty gritty details. Um, happy to uh, to point you in that way as well. And if you want, to, we want to help actually develop. If you're a developer, we would love your help. Um, that's on GitHub as well under Telehash. Good. Okay. Well, thank you so much.